Welcome to Talking Tuesdays. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today we have a guest, and our guest is going to be Lewis. Welcome to the podcast, Lewis. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So today's podcast is going to be all about education, and the reason I had Lewis come on is because Lewis is an ex-colleague of mine, probably the best colleague I've had, but Lewis has an interesting background <laughs> with a, a degree from Canada, right? Yep, McGill University. Okay, and then you've got an MBA from Baruch. From the fine Baruch uh, College, I guess, uh, in New York City, yeah. Okay, so Lewis has two degrees. I also have two degrees. We both work in quantitative finance, so somewhat of a higher educational route. Um, but Lewis also has an interesting characteristic where he likes to do home improvement projects. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the, word, the word like that you're using there is just too strong. It's too strong. <laughs> I, I... So I figured we'd have a good conversation today just on education yeah. and just talking about universities, education, and kind of the spectrum here. So let's just start off with here, right? What are, what are your thoughts on college degrees? There seems to be a lot of debate on, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Should you go? Should you not go? So t really, it's a, I mean, obviously very broad question um, and tough question to answer, right? I think... I think for the for the for the marginal, you know, high school student, you know, decent grades, you know, probably it's probably the right move, right? Yeah, it's probably the right thing to do. Um, you go to go to a you know some normal college, um, you know, you got to pay for it. You're taking out probably what a I don't know what it costs these days. One fifty, two hundred plus, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, like, it's crazy expensive now. 30, 40, 50 and upwards grand a year. Um, I mean, back in, you know, when I was first looking at college, 50 grand a year was like the top. That was like Harvard, Princeton, you know, all the Ivies, whatever. Um, and then all the wannabe Ivies that were charging what they were, but weren't, you weren't getting the first seat. Like, I think it was like Washington University in St. Louis or something. There were a couple other ones that I had applied to that were kind of in that, you know, price range, but not the, you know, not the caliber. They didn't have the name. Um, didn't have the alumni network and everything like that, but part of I think part of the, the the college or you know university industry is you know you can charge all shitloads of money. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If, can I curse on this? Yeah, know. go for it. We're all good. Fan, fan <laughs> fantastic. Um, but that being said, I still think I still think it's generally probably a smart move for again the marginal high school student because you know it's kind of becoming almost you have to have it. Right. Right. Hey, what are you gonna, What are you going to do without it? Right. So you either. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So my argument is I don't know if it's worth it anymore. And, yeah, but and because here's one of the here's one of the things I've thought thought about with this is so think about like our grandparents. Right. If you had like a high school graduation, like you had that high school diploma, like you were somebody you could, you they, could yeah. do something. Right. Yeah. And then I think about like I don't know, a generation or two, like our parents, like college is still kind of new. But if you had a college degree. Like that was cutting edge. Right. And now you have like our industry, like finance and banking right now. It's like you got to have a master's just to barely. PhD. The... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then the question is, where does it stop? When are you going to need two PhDs? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so like my extracurricular was I flew to Mars and back when I was seven <laughs> years old. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I hear your point. But 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 think of but think on the other hand. OK, so. So what types of work is out there, right? There's there's stuff like what we do, right? Which is generally, like you say, you need some type of track to get onto, right? You need like an education system, you know, you need you need a couple degrees, you need to have experience, all, you know, high, high, higher skilled labor. Um, you have low skilled, not low skilled, but you know, the trades, for example. Yeah, yeah. Right, you, can make a crap, you make a crap load of money. I got a buddy who's an HVAC guy who's making close to a hundred grand a year with no education. And he's, he's a really nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. You yeah. Know? And see, um, this, this is where I always wonder, I saw a statistic once and it was like, if you take a plumber and you take a doctor, a plumber makes more money than a doctor until the age of 40. Right. Then by the age of 40, the doctor passes you and makes more money. Yeah. Right. And I think one of the big lies I think for me is that, I don't know, I feel everyone says you need the college degree, so everybody's going to get it. 
But the question is, is like, what is it worth anymore? Did you really need that education to get that job? Or are we just requiring more and more and more education for something you don't really need? There's, I mean, there's definitely like an aspect of, I don't know what the right word to use, like social proof or like some bullshit where, you know, everyone has had a college degree. You need a college degree. We're not going to hire anyone without a college degree. We've all got college degrees. What are we going to do? Hire some kid off the street who may know what, you know what I mean? It's like there, there's, there's some like herd kind of mentality to it that keeps it around, you know? Yeah. In, uh, but I think there has, you have to draw a distinction here between in terms of learning the skills and, and you know, what uh, a college or university experience will give you. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, is it marketable? Is it going to get me a job? Something like that. Right? right. Those are, those are two different things because you know, you can go online and learn half the crap that we know in, in a, in a year or two, a couple of years, you know, yeah, you, you can, they have all these, you know, coding boot camps and things like that. You can go learn how to code online on your own. And, you know, if you're driven and, and, you know, you, you, you push and you, you can get a decent, a good job as a coder making, you know, a hundred plus a year, right? It's not unheard of. Um, but that's, I mean, me personally, can't do it. There's no way. There's no way. If you had sat me down and said, Lewis, here's here's the 200 grand that you would have spent on college. I'm going to put it in your pocket. Uh, you have four years to learn how to be, you know. Yeah. Uh, like your skill set. <laughs> yeah, to learn advanced statistics or to learn, you know, how to code in seven languages and, and, and web programming and or mobile program, whatever the hell you want to do. Hell no! I would have pissed that money away, and I would have been sleeping until eleven o'clock every day. You know what I mean? That's but that's me. So I think part of the answer, part of the part of the answer to your question is really you also have to know yourself. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I see a lot. So from my side, right, consulting students, high school students, college students, everybody always says like, I'm going to do self learning. I'm going to do online. But from the quality of people I see that get the online degree or get the self learning thing. It's never very good. And there's always yeah. that one person, right? There's that one guy that's like really good or girl, right? right. Super educated, self-taught and amazing. But I think I think you're right. I, even for me, for you, right? It's like, I don't know if I'm going to put in all that time. <laughs> I'm not held to a class schedule. I'm not required to show up on, you know, do the exams, get the degree and all that. Exactly. I, I, I would completely agree. To, I mean, which is also kind of a sad, I mean, it's a sobering thing to admit too. I would love to say that Hell yes, I spent six months and I learned Java and now I am like, you know, got my day job making making buku bucks and I and you know two hours a day on the side I'm I'm you know programming you know some application on downloading on iPhone and I'm making you know it's but it's never gonna yeah. happen let's be real <laughs> like I'll do it for a week and be like you know you know what sucks this <laughs> I'm completely with you on that. You know, so you got to be realistic. But but like you said, there's always that one person, you know. Bill Gates dropped out of high school and uh, or dropped out of college and started Microsoft. And look at him. He's a billionaire. Well, yeah, I mean, he's the one guy, you know. Yeah. It's, that's a, that's just a tough, that's a tough ask of people, I think. I don't know. Like I said, for the, I think for the marginal, marginal high school student, the, mar the, you know, average grades, the complete, you know, top of the bell curve. Yeah. That guy, that guy's got, probably it's the best, it's. But I hear your criticisms as well. You yeah, know? and I think I think part of it is it's just misleading. When everyone says, right, everybody needs to get a college degree, I think it should just be reworded. It should be everybody needs to get an education. Yeah. Right. Which is which, which is which is a t which is a different thing. Yeah, because I mean I see the same thing you see. I have a bu buddy of mine, different person than yours, right? Different friend of mine, works in HVAC as well, lives in Hawaii. He's living the dream. Like he absolutely loves it, dude. Great, <laughs> great spot, family, and everything. And he, he told me, he goes, I can't, I can't sit down and sit in a class for, you know, hours a day studying. That's just not me. I don't want to sit in an office job. Again, right, he makes good money. He has a good yeah. life and a good living. But again, he had to go to school and get education and training and figure out how to do the skills that he's doing for a living. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the question I think I look at now is, is the university systems really adding the value they're claiming? And perhaps maybe the grades are starting to get inflated a little bit. Oh, yeah. And maybe they're kind of lessening the courses so more people can get in. So now we're kind of letting everybody in as a money-making machine. So there's a, there's a lot of topics there. I mean, 
you know, I, I, so I have a huge issue with the, with, look, just talk about the financial aspect of it. I mean, like, like I was saying earlier, you have these second, third tier colleges that are priced exactly the same as a Harvard, a Yale, you know, an MIT or something like that, um, which is bullshit. Yeah. Why would like I'm going to like <laughs> Joe Schmo University in the middle of freaking Podunk, Alabama, and I'm paying the same amount of money as somebody going to Harvard? There's absolutely <laughs> no way we're getting the same value out of our experience, right? Yeah. Or, or for our money, you know, there, there's just absolutely no way. And so part of how I think you know colleges or universities, whatever, are priced um, is a, is a total wreck. Oh yeah. It's a it's a total it's a total wreck. Um, you know, the reason I went to Baruch when I was doing my MBA, so I went to, like, as you mentioned, I went to Canada for yep. my undergrad. I'm a Canadian citizen, so my tuition was much cheaper. I was paying, geez, my biggest cost when I was living up there was rent, which was a couple hundred bucks a month. You yeah. know, I was paying, I think, four grand a year. This was in, what, 05 to 09? So four grand a year um, for a probably a you know relatively good education yeah um and that was you know that was my my education my, my tuition cost was the least expensive thing i was paying for up there yeah so i um, was paying around the same time as you about ten thousand. right just just a state school this isn't like a private ivy league or anything that just a generic state school right exactly um and well, so well, there's there's another thing up there as well because you know the Canadian uh, universities are, are good, um, on par with the U.S. universities again for the marginal you know school, um, but they're pissed now because they're like, well, all these international kids are coming and abusing our <laughs> our cheap our cheap uh, you know tuition costs, right? They're getting they're getting way more 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 out of it than they're paying. Um, so just to, to to spare my reputation, I'm trying to move back to Canada, baby. Go Canada. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I'm trying to, so, but anyway, um, but, but so think about that. And then I went to Baruch where I paid 20 grand a year in 2000, I think 13 to 15 were the two years that I did there. Yeah. Um, and that was to me, that was, you know, I was a broke kid who was, you know, getting out of my first couple of years of, of the work, you know, the work experience. I thought that was a crazy amount of money, but at the same time I was like, should I apply to Columbia and pay 200? For you know, like a uh, hundred grand a year, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and it probably would have been worth it, to be honest with you. Okay. Right. Because so, at that at that point in my life, I had to drive. I knew what I wanted to do, um, and it would have. So that's where you know you're old enough where that network is going to actually pay off, right? Yeah. Coming coming out of Columbia undergrad or NYU undergrad, I'm, I'm talking New York because that's what I know. Um, you know, at, when you're 22 years old, I mean, yeah, there's some network effects there. You can call people, you know, professors maybe can, can hook you up or something like that. Uh, but I think that really pays off when you get older and you're in an industry, you have experience. Um, so that's that. Uh, so that's that kind of aspect of it. That's so, off topic. But, but, but no, but how do you how do you think you fix the financing problem? Because I look at it from the, the point of view of, right, you want you want to be a nice person. Right, you want to let everybody go to college that wants to go to college. Right, that's kind of like the story that's being underlaid, and it makes sense in many ways. But then, if the, the government provides all the funding, like there's an infinite supply of dollars, yeah. obviously universities are going to say, "Hey, we can just keep raising the dollars because the university or the government will keep funding it at that rate." I, I'm so I'm part of an investment forum online, um, and I've debated this topic, like. God, multiple times with people, and and there there are solutions all around, right? So my deal is this: I think that the market is distorted because you can't really discharge a student loan in bankruptcy. So once you sign that paper, you are paying that until it's paid off, no matter what. Right. Right. So if if you're a lender, if you're somebody who's you know giving somebody this money, you'll make all those loans all day long, zero zero default risk. Oh you yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, so, and it makes sense, though, because I always tell people, they complain about it. I say, but if, imagine if you made the default available. Right. Everybody at the end of it would just say, you know what? I have no credit anyways. I'm a college okay. student. <laughs> I'm done with this. Just write it off. Yeah. But <laughs> my So my solution was this, and it's not perfect, but it was like, um, it was there, ha there should be like a time period. Call it like, I don't know, seven years, 10 years, some time period. Once you're done with that, it's a great. Uh, or done with, you know, with that, 
whatever that loan was paying for. Yeah. Um, where you can write it off. Because think about it this way. This is this is how I thought about it was all right, two people have taken out two hundred grand to go to say NYU, right? Okay. Good school, but not like the best school. Um, you have you have opportunities both ways. Either one of these people can greatly succeed or they can sit in their mom's basement and totally blow, you know, screw off. Um, but after 10 years, what do you think what do you think's going to happen? One person will have done really well. Mm -hmm. He's got a family, he's got investment accounts, he's got a, you know, uh, a home, he's got all these things. He's not going to declare bankruptcy just to pay off, you know, he's got a good paying job, whatever. There's no way he he's he got, you know, that loan paid off for him. And right. so he's going to keep paying it off until he pays it off because it's a lot easier to do that than it is going to be to, you know, sell my house you know, sell, you know, liquidate my retirement accounts to just to go through bankruptcy to get rid of this. Yeah. But then that kid sitting in his mom's basement, he's already got nothing, right? He doesn't have, doesn't have a house. <laughs> he's living on a, sleeping on a futon. So, <laughs> so he, for him, it makes sense to declare bankruptcy. And for him, he should, because that loan hasn't paid off for him at all. You know? So, but that here's the question. Has done but, nothing. So is that assuming a government loan or a corporate loan, like a banking loan? A government loan. Like if we, a student loan. So here's be my argument against it. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. The issue I have a lot. So when I applied for loans, I went through the applications for the government loans, and then I went through the application for the private loans. Right. Okay. Nobody would finance me. None of the private loans, only the government loans. Okay. But the weird thing for me was that what they asked on the application had nothing to do with the education. It's like making an investment, right? But no one cares about the investment. Right. So I think, I don't know. They should, I think they should look at the degrees. Like if you want to go out and get a degree that makes more money coming out on average, yeah. you should be more likely to get a loan given your academic record and your financial history. Yeah. Because I see so many people where it's like, you know what I'd love to do? I would love to go get an English degree. Sure. And it, it's like, yeah, I mean, that's a fun degree. and It'd be exciting. You can read books and write papers and study <laughs> literature. But at the end of the day, we all know it doesn't pay well. I mean, you're going to be a school teacher making 36000 and you can't pay it back. And so then it comes back to that quality aspect here, which is, do you even need a degree to be a, to be a teacher? And, yeah. I mean, you graduated high school, so can you not teach the same material you already <laughs> learned? Like, <laughs> I, I See, I'm a little hesitant with, to go with that solution because then what ends up happening is, okay, so you leave it completely, almost completely up to market forces, right? What's going to happen? You're going to have a a billion engineering degrees, you know, anyone who wants to become an engineer is going to get a, is going to get a loan, right? right? Which as they should, right? We need more engineers. That's a, that's a valuable skill. Um, but you know, 3% of people who want to be a, I don't know, Romanian English, you know, <laughs> uh, study, study the philosophy of, I don't know, sub-Saharan, whatever the hell, right? You're going to get like two of them in the whole country. And maybe maybe that's how it should be. Maybe there should only be two. But I I, I don't know, man. So, there's something, something that makes me feel a little uneasy about that situation where it's like, well, I guess we're all going to be engineers. I guess we're all going to be, you know, model, you know, model risk management people. You know, we're all going to be. <laughs> like, See, but even now, though, I think students know you can look up the salary and realize like an engineer is going to make more. A STEM degree is going to make far more than an arts degree. Right, right. Right. And my concern now is that you have too many people getting worthless degrees. Right. Who A, shouldn't have been in college to start with. Yeah. B, got a crappy degree. And then you have this massive loan, which is financed by the government, which realistically is financed by the U.S. people. And then they default on it. And then it's like, I don't know. I think the only way to really push towards a better system is to have that market-driven component of it. But again, how do you, how do you finance a college student? Right. We're both in finance. You have no credit when you're 18, 19 years yeah. old, even 20 years old. So how would you judge different people? I think that's kind of the the challenging piece is how do you define it? See, I think at some point the the non dischargeableness in bank in other words, it's 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 there has to be some you have to there has to be some default risk in there because that's going to lower the price. Okay, you know I see what, what I mean. The, like it's a problem that. It's, it's not necessarily a problem that there are so many English degrees out there. 
It's a problem that there are so many two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar English degrees out there. If it cost a hundred grand or you know ten grand, uh, that wouldn't be as big of an issue. Yeah, you know, because the it, it wouldn't be as much of a problem for these people to get a job at Starbucks once they're done. Once they're done with their degree, I say these people, but um, <laughs> you know, I. I, I I know English majors. My buddy's a film major, and he's working for the government, making you know the state of Colorado or the city of Denver. I forget which, making forty, fifty grand a year, paying a couple hundred bucks to his student loans. Um, you know, and but to his credit, he went to a you know he didn't go to a two hundred thousand uh, dollar, you know, not year but total school, right? So it's manageable yeah. for him. So I think part of it also has to do with the price, and I think the prices are so high is because. They'll give you whatever money you want because they know you can't get rid of it. You're going to have to keep paying that until you're dead, essentially, um, which is kind of whack, you know? Yeah. I think it's just definitely a challenging problem of how do you balance, right, the cost part of it, but how do you make it, yeah. I don't know, somewhat fair, but also, like, meaningful to society. So exactly. I, yeah, I definitely view it as an economics problem. I feel like you have all these people, and then it's like, all right, they're all graduating high school. How do you assign them to the optimal job? Right. And I mean, you know, the other thing is, uh, so you're up on, I mean, it's a bigger uh, philosophical question there is what's the optimal job? Is it what is going to be, you know, what is, what is the most economically efficient? Is that what it's all about? Because hell, I want, I really want to be an artist, man. <laughs> you know, I really want to be an artist and, you know, is life worth living if I can't be an artist? I don't know. That's kind of it's kind of messed up to. That's what I'm saying. It's kind of messed up to just push people towards those things or only allow people to to go to those things that. All right, so there's some aspect of that. It can't. I, I don't think it can be purely market driven. You don't um, think so? I think it would be that. I think, for example, like you don't need a you don't need a college degree to be an English major. That's you, true. You, yeah, you, you don't need. I mean, that, think about the great point. artists in the world. How many just <laughs> truly true. great artists went to college and they're like, you know what? I studied this and now I'm the best because of it. We're all working from home now, so I'll just set up an easel right here, you know? <laughs> I just feel like if you got rid of a lot of the funding for it, yeah, people would start degrading the degrees again, where it's like you would need an undergrad degree to be really yeah. good at like an engineer, but you wouldn't have to go out and get, you know, that seventy, eighty thousand dollars master's degree. And then it's like, now I need a PhD, so another five to seven years. Yeah. It's like hard to keep it all in balance. And I think part of the struggle from a, like a personal perspective is when you're 18 or 19, you have no idea what jobs are oh, out there. No. How can you? And I think that's part of the struggle we need to focus on is I think in high schools, for example, they should spend more time bringing in professionals and then having them talk about like their paths. Like, you know, I'm an, I'm an, let's say I'm a, I don't know, an auto mechanic, but I went to this type of schooling for two years to be an auto mechanic and I have to do ASC certification every year or every two years. And they go through that and explain it. And then you'd have someone that comes in like us and says, you know, I work in finance. I'm really a statistician. So I build statistical models. I mean, most people on my channel are weird people like me that are lost. They go, I have a stats degree or a math degree. What do you, what do, you do <laughs> Without, with that, right? What, what industry do you even work in? And the worst part is even the universities don't know. Right. Like I have parents emailing me saying, my, my son is 22 years old and he's graduating in like, I don't know, six months or something. And I found your channel but there's no job options out there. Do you know of any other careers? He thinks finance might be interesting. Well, I mean, that was my deal because coming out of coming out of my uh, bachelor's degree, college or whatever, my undergrad, um, I wanted to work in finance. I wanted to work for a bank, right? Yeah. Intellectually challenging. The money was good, right? Um, and it was 2009 when I graduated. Nobody was hiring. Oh, and yeah. for three, four years, I pretty much took like crap jobs in New York, in the New York City area making for 30 40 50 grand a year just to get by went back got an MBA and then it was the it was I guess the job recruiting part of the MBA you know apparatus um, that got that landed me a gig where I am now had the skills for it the whole time mm -hmm. you know and, and for me I mean I've told you this many times privately didn't learn a damn thing during my MBA. Let's be real, <laughs> right? Um, but had this had the had the technical skills the entire time. But it was just the opportunity that was needed, right? Right. So, and, so, so I, yeah, and that's one of my big concerns here, right? Is are you paying for the degree? 
Right. Because as, as you know, I'm a big critic of the MBA program. I took MBA classes at one of the, the best MBA <laughs> programs in the country. And the class curriculum was the exact same as my cheap undergrad state college. Exactly. But I was pay, but those students were paying 100000 a year. Well, it's, 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 I mean, even, even undergrad at the, at the Harvard versus state school level is not the, the curriculum is not much different. I mean, think about it. What, what is the, what is a 19 year old in, I don't know, what's some undergrad liberal arts course at college in Har at Harvard going to learn that's different from the same course in, you know, Bumblefuck, Alabama, wherever. Yeah. Um, I'm hating on Alabama. I hope you don't have a lot of Alabama. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. If we'll you do, see. I'm sorry. It's a beautiful state. Um, but what, is, is it really that different at the undergrad level? I would argue no. I would argue absolutely not. I think that at the undergrad level, you're definitely getting, you know, you're getting more of a university experience than you are a real education. You know, right. you can go, like you said, like we were saying, you can go on Khan Academy down and, and it's the same damn thing, right? But it's but it's everything surrounding it that you're that you're kind of paying for, you know. Yeah, and see, my issue now is like looking at. So I work with a ton of students from online to third world countries to U.S., Canada, Ivy leagues, everything in the middle. And you just have so many people. I feel like they come from so many different backgrounds now that I actually see a big difference in the degrees. So like you were saying, right between Harvard and between like a state school, I'm not seeing a lot. Like it's close. But then you start seeing a lot of like the online degrees, like there's nothing there. Like they've taken so minimal amount of coursework, they can't even catch up to get to where you're at. And now oh, I yeah. feel like one of the big issues is so for financial engineering degrees, you should be taking a lot of math and stats. All these MBA programs are running out, taking an MBA course, adding like one or two math and stats courses. Yeah, and, that's not gonna. And then stamping it <laughs> as you know an MFE, which is fine. But then they go out and they get an accreditation to be STEM designated. See, what the hell does that even so, mean? So and who is accrediting this? Like, <laughs> so this is my issue now, right? What's the point of even having the accreditation right. if it's just going to muddy the waters now? Because as someone hiring or someone that's looking for a good school from a student perspective is, do you pick the state school, which seems like a really good value over the Ivy League, or do you just cheap out all the way and get the online degree? And how do you tell the difference? Yeah. Right. Students are coming to me saying, Dimitri, you know, tell me about this program. Tell me about this program. And it's really hard for me to tell you, like, I know this is a top rated program, but this is the biggest waste of money you're ever going to spend. And it's terrible. <laughs> like it's a hundred thousand dollar degree and it's worth nothing. Right. Because you, it's so hard to balance it. I think the issue now with the U.S. system, at least, is the accreditation has gone out the window. Oh, yeah. So it's like what's if someone could come up with a really good online degree. You could put in a lot less work to engineer it and design a better quality one, and then there's perhaps no, build a mass market it. There's no good way to do it. There, I, I'm I'm convinced this is like this is an unsolvable problem because you know we're the biggest problem. I mean, th think about it. I mean, look, Trump University. The whole point of it was to just start spitting out degrees to people, charge them up the ass, and so that they can go to whatever job and say, "I have a college degree." You know, that yeah. was the entire point of the entire of, of, of it was just a scheme. Right. And the, and you're seeing the same thing, like you say, with these with these, you know, random accreditations on, you know, the whatever boot camp says that I'm the best damn Python coder you've ever seen. Well, prove, you know, prove it. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. And I don't think there's an easy way around that. Yeah. And I think that's just so challenging because it comes back to like the who do you grant loans to? Right. Right. In an ideal world, I would say, OK, the smartest students who have good career paths, who are driven, who could finish the course material should all somehow try to get funding. They should get funding in some ways. We want them to go on. The students that you know are going to drop out, it's a waste of money to even fund them. But again, how separating that out is such a challenge, right? Maybe you should it go is. to something different. Like maybe your dad is a banker, but you just don't have it in you. Maybe you should go find something more enjoyable. Maybe you don't have the passion. And then the accreditation part, I think, is just, I don't know. I see it just weakening every year because the bar is set so high, like when we were in college and even before us. But now it's like universities are essentially incentivized, right, to get more students. Right. Because you get paid more. And if they drop out, guess what? Who cares? doesn't matter. You still get paid. Sign the next one up. And so I think one of the issues we see in the U.S. is I think they need to set a different accreditation board who knows what they're actually doing. It's not government ran, perhaps. 
Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like employer focused, right? Employers can weigh in and say, you know, I got engineers from these five schools. I would rank the schools, you know, one to five in this ranking. And maybe you could help weed out. Because I think now the issue is, is everybody's going and getting a degree. Yeah. The schools have lowered the education level so low that, you, I mean, you're all passing and getting degrees. But now the employer at the other end saying, like, I don't want to take you with an undergrad. So now I'm going to require a master's degree. And now I want an Ivy League school or I want like a good state school on the other end of it. That's that's tough. I mean, so it's funny because some some employers kind of are like that. Um, I'll give you an example. Of, so an example from Baru, uh, the, I think the CFO of Colgate mm-hmm. would hire, he was a Baru grad. And so he knew he would hire, you know, kids from Baru because I think he knew firsthand what the curriculum was, what the culture was, who this, who the student body was. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think there is some type of, in, which is essentially, it's, it's, it's a, which is a type of accreditation, right? In this guy's eyes, this school, you know, was pumping out kids that met the grade, right? Right. Um, so I think there is a level of informality to that uh, within different industries. You know, you know, if you want to, if, if you're getting a, some guy getting like a, a, some, you know, masters of science or whatever out of MIT, he probably knows a little bit of what he's talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, maybe not. But but probably he does. Right. Again, the average the average uh, graduate from MIT. Um, So I think there is some uh, reputation is it's a gray area. right? Reputation is huge in this in in, because it it functions, as you're saying, as the type of accreditation. Right. Um, So so where do you see it going in the long run then? Right. Because I see the same thing. Like when I see students from specific schools coming through, I know that these ones are going to be better than other ones. Right. So it's easier to say, hey, I've got, you know, 100 resumes, 200 resumes to look at. And I'm digging through the stack. It's like, all right, these schools I all have heard of. I know they're good schools. I know the curriculum's fairly well put together. And I can easily just sort them based on that. And I think, right, a lot of people are going to say, well, it's kind of biased. It's unfair. But it is that accreditation piece that you're still going to have to interview 100 out of those 200. Exactly. And it's still going to get narrowed down even further based on credentials and performance and personal metrics. But... Repu- reputation is incredibly important, I think, in, in this in this regard. I mean, Harvard is always going to pump out good school, uh, good students because they take care of their reputation. You know, <laughs> Tr- on the opposite end of the spectrum, Trump Re- Trump University <laughs> never had a reputation, and they sure as hell didn't care to build one, right? And they're and so they're so they're out of business. Um, I, I, and and everything is going to fall somewhere in that spectrum. But but I should you prevent that of, though? That's the other question that? I have. How, should you prevent that, you know, those Trump universities, those one-off Khan Academy? Because, right. I mean, I've thought about, like, hey, I could create my own academic training course. <laughs> I could charge you, you know, these schools are charging, I don't know, $50, $60. There's an online course, I won't say which one, that teaches financial engineering. They charge less, but I mean, it's still like $20,000. They, short, they shorten the course, so it's super short. I think it's like a year. And then you, they rush you through this, and then you're stamped, and you're, you're a graduate. And I'm like... right. But, but you don't learn the same material. It was cheaper, but 20000 is a whole lot of money yeah. for nothing. Like, you're not getting a lot of the you know, other end of the deal on that. For the student, I would imagine that's probably not a great deal. You know what I mean? Like, no. <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, would you have, you know, gone for that? No way. Oh, there's of course not. A, not. There's no, there's I no mean, way. I mean, I felt like, so I went into undergrad. I'm like the first college grad, me and my sister and our family. So it's like... We didn't really know. I just went to a generic state school. But then after I went, I realized, like, I can't get a job coming from Washington State to New York or Chicago or anywhere in the finance industry. So it's like you had to figure out, right, those the school names. Who's the big school? Who's hiring? How do you get accreditation? Yep. I mean, I remember in so at University of Michigan, we would have, like, Goldman Sachs and Lazards and Bain and BCG, all these big companies whining and dining us and serving free food and, like, but I have a handout. You'd get like a free mug and like, thanks for BC, coming. BCG Platinian was there. They had a booth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trying to get you to come over there. Uh, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And you're I remember we were, right. when I was in undergrad, the right finance degree, major, everything else. It was like Frito-Lay coming to see if you wanted to be like a regional sales rep, which there's nothing against that. But it's like, there's no finance company anywhere around us. Right. Exactly. And <laughs> Part, yeah. part, but part of it, part of it is on the students or the, you know, the person taking out this loan. It's part of it's on their back too, right? They have to be an informed. 
you can't just because someone will give you a loan for two hundred thousand dollars doesn't mean you should take it out and go be a philosophy you know major at <laughs> Trump University, right? Just because just because someone will give that to you does not mean it's a good idea, you know? Yeah, and that's and part of, as, and that's part of my concern though with the whole bankruptcy thing. Like people always want that forgiveness, and yeah. I'm always like, I'm just hesitating. It's like there's people out there that just don't care and they take the loan. Yeah, but they, they just don't care. They take the loan. So I can understand if it's a government, you know, sure, the taxpayer would pay for that. Yeah. I, I, I kind of agree. One of the other, one of the other um, uh, so, solutions, I don't know if, it, again, I don't think anything, I don't think there's any one solution. I don't think there's a perfect answer out there. Yeah. One of them, have, have the school um, kind of maintain a portion of the loan on their books, right? So now, they, now they're vested, right? Um, this is another... Not a, not necessarily a bad idea. I think it's a right? good idea. I think it puts a lot of the burden on them because I think right now the problem is right. Somebody external gives you a loan. Yeah. The school doesn't really care because you're getting paid regardless if you provide a good service or a bad service. Right. So I think it's actually a pretty good one right there. Yeah, that's I I think there's merit to that for sure. Um, you know I I don't know I I I, I have a lot of sympathy for the people who have took out a loan that they thought was going to be good and maybe it's my maybe this is my personal bias like i said graduating with a finance you know go, wanting to go into finance in the midst of a financial crisis uh, yeah. you know i have sympathy <laughs> for the people who are like i took out this great engineering degree uh but i live in you know uh, you know in a mud hut there's nothing to engineer here you know <laughs> my, my degree is useless right not not for not for any faults of their own, right? So I have I think there should be some forgiveness there, but but again, maybe that's my bias there. Um, but that's it. But see, the other question to go back to the accreditation thing is how to how or or you know how do you judge these kids or how do you judge these programs, right? Like you know you've got the SAT. Remember the SAT coming oh, yeah. out of high school? Yeah. The, which is which is a mess. The weird it's thing about it, this is I found is weird. No one I knew studied for it except for one kid. Like we all just showed up and it was like, all right, you know, I got my calculator here and I'm just going to take the SAT. You talk to all these people we work with that are from yeah. other countries and they're like, oh, I studied for like three years and like I was so focused in like doing all the work. I'm like, jeez. No, I was like, most Americans, I don't think care. <laughs> we had we had SAT prep uh, classes at our school and they taught us how to take the test. Oh, we didn't get nothing. I'm expecting well, like you know, I'm expecting you calculus too. on the exam, and I show up and it's like algebra. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't I study know. for this. This was like two years ago. <laughs> I know, but that's that's what I mean when I say it's a joke. And I read an article recently that I think this was last year. The College Board, which is the group that administers the SAT, mm -hmm. they added like an adversity score to the. In yeah, other words, I, I saw that. Did you see this? Yeah. For, for I, I'll explain it. Um, so it's, I guess they, they do some type of profiling based on your life situation and they give you a score, which then is going to be used to either scale up or I guess scale down perhaps. I don't know fully yeah. how it works. Your overall score. Yeah. And your, which your, your is zip fucking code, bullshit. <laughs> your zip code plays into it too. Cause if you grow up in a yeah. rich neighborhood, you get docked. If right. you grow up in a, a poor neighborhood, then you get increased. Right, which I mean, I'm thinking if I'm really desperate to get my kid into, you know, go to the hood, yes. rent out a little crappy two bedroom apartment, you know, <laughs> say he lives there, and she, you know, yeah, she's the put system it on the because it's a messed up system. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think part of the problem with the standardized tests is they try to make them so standard to the point that it's like they're useless. Yeah, it just meets the average. It's like, why not make an exam? that ranges from super easy to like college graduate level. So you have a huge range of problem solving to do. And then right. have people take the exams and then actually weed out the people and figure out like, oh, this kid's actually like a sophomore in college. He's already right. smarter on the math. He should be perfect in the, these universities. While somebody else like me, for example, might just be average or slightly below average. So it's like just send me to a general state school. At least you're getting a better match of your qualities and what you can do and the funding would be lined up better, I feel like. Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, I get where they're coming from, too. They want to, you know, uh, sure. I mean, let, use us, for example. 
my high school had SAT prep classes. Yours didn't, yeah. right? There's definitely, I was definitely at, a, at an advantage in that sense, right? Yeah. Um, you were probably just smarter than I was anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, so I see what they're trying to do. It just, it's like, there's so much correction and then overcorrection and then, that it, it just winds up becoming useless. Like, how do you, somebody says, somebody says, yeah, I got a perfect score on the SAT. So, so freaking what? Or yeah. somebody says, you know, I barely passed it. So freaking what? Like, it, it, it's almost gotten to the point where it's meaningless, right? Yeah. I so, think... again, it goes to this point of how the heck do you accreditate these schools? How do you, you know, make a judgment on a kid who to give a loan to or not? You know, it's, it's, a, t- it's a tough question. Yeah. You know? I'm with you. And even like, so going even to lower levels, so like state exams. Did you guys have any like high school state exams? We had, we did, we had, what were they called? It was in New York. The, oh, the Regents okay. was what they were called. Um, yeah, regional. I don't know what that stands for. But it was a, it was a test coming out of, I guess, middle school, going into yep. high school yep. that you had to take. Yeah. So Texas has the STAR exam and Washington State, when I was there, had the Wassel. Okay. So the thing that for me that like makes it worth completely worthless is they had the Wassel when I was young and they published the exam and we were like some of the first kids to take it. So we took the exam and it was always like a year or two behind us. So like if you were in eighth grade, it was like sixth grade material. If you were like in 10th grade, it was like eighth grade material, which I always thought was stupid because it's like, how are you going to remember two years ago? And then the kids that were always behind. That was like perfect for them. So it's kind of geared towards them. I got, I got held back for two years when I aced this test. <laughs> but the worst part of the entire thing was that not enough students passed the exam when they did it. So what they did is the teachers complained because they started only teaching to the exam now instead of teaching the right. material to learn. And right. then Washington started lowering the bar every year. So yeah. now it's like you're taking like sixth grade material you should have known in eighth grade. And then it was like they're dumbing it down to like maybe fifth grade material and then fourth grade material. And, <laughs> and people were failing. The, the failure rates were going up, I think, every year. Oh, my God. So I'm like, so we're getting dumber and dumber. And it's like, <laughs> I agree with the exam. They should have some sort of metric to see like where are the students academically are the teachers yeah there's gotta be a baseline i get that yeah but then again it's like if you i don't know how do you create that exam how do you hold teachers to it one of the issues i think is that there's so many government employees as teachers you can never get fired i had had a math teacher that walked in on the first day and said you know i'm i'm an art teacher (laughs) but they needed an algebra teacher so i'm gonna teach your algebra (laughs) this year so i'm taking over (laughs) And the guy didn't know anything. He couldn't help. So you'd have to like, I'd have to like go to my sister who's two years above me and ask her like, hey, can you help me figure this out? <laughs> like, I mean, how are these teachers not getting fired? How do they, like, I don't know. I just think it's the a same, mess. The same, not to make it political, but the same way cops don't get fired, the same way, you know, all these, it's, 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 again, it's tough. It's like, I get the reason why you need to teach. Okay, my father, for full disclosure, my father's an art teacher. Yeah. And he's a, he teaches in a southern uh, South Bronx public school. Thousands of kids, at least when it was open pre-COVID or whatever, thousands of kids, pretty rowdy from his, his – he goes to me, he goes, it's not even the kids' fault. The majority of kids, when they're failing in school, it's the parents. It's because they come from a crappy environment. Mm-hmm. Parents don't give a damn. Most teachers, generally decent. Yes, you get the the crazy one, you know, the ones who are deserved to be fired on the spot, who they can't. They sit in like some room or something like that. Yeah. Um. So I get that, but but he's like he's like, and he goes he goes, yeah, I'm part of the union, but I hate it. It's like I wish I wish there wasn't a union. Yeah. So and I I don't know. I just think the problem is like when you mention like teachers should be measured on merit. I see right. all these teachers like jumping up on Facebook complaining, whoa, you can't whoa, whoa. fire me. <laughs> right? And I, this is how I make my living. It's so hard being a teacher. Can I, can I just sit here and do nothing and collect a paycheck and a pension and great benefits? But Not I think... That, but, but, then, but then the messed up part is I have another friend who was my age, my friend Samantha, went to school to be an art teacher. Like, as my dad was an art teacher, tenured, what could, he couldn't get fired. He happened to actually do his damn job. But she was like working and I remember going to school after work in New York City, desperate to become an art teacher because she loved it. And she was good as well. Yeah. She'd get hired for two years. Right before she was going to get tenured, they'd fire her. 
She'd go work for another district for two years and the same thing over and over. So she was getting paid nothing. And she's like, screw this. Why the hell would I ever, would ever want to become a teacher yeah. when they're incentivized to never, you know, pay me or, or keep me on long enough to actually become part of the union or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's just, it's such a mess. I think they should privatize it because I think a lot of the teachers don't realize like if you're that really good teacher, yeah. And there's always kids like you could remember like oh and like I don't know for me in fourth grade Mrs. Anderson was like the greatest <laughs> teacher I ever had and she taught us like life skills like for example we learned how to read a map. So before right. inter- before internet and you know you could just type it in your phone and she got in trouble from the district because that's not part of the curriculum. And I was right. I was what kind of bullshit is that? Yeah, I look at it and I think she was the greatest teacher if they would have done it more on like a capitalist system where it's like the better teachers got paid more, but you could actually pay them more. Yeah. And then you could get rid of the not so good teachers. Yeah. But then we run into the same problem. How do you know who's the better teacher? Oh, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you do performance reviews. <laughs> just go on, what was it? Rate my professor. Yeah. That was the one that we, I don't know if it's the same. She got a hot go chili pepper on, my... on her. So, you know, we got to keep her. <laughs> yeah. But then you got the Russian bots going in there and saying like, you know, <laughs> This guy's a great seizure. This guy sucks. You know, it's a t- it's a tough. Again, it's a tough. I, I I I like the public system because, but I but I just think that there's too much protection in terms of what you can do to teachers, what you can't. Yeah. You know. I I don't know. I just think they need to get rid of the government system with it. I'm all <laughs> I'm all for the voucher system where it's like this other problem too, right? Say you're a poor kid and you live yeah. in a poor neighborhood, and who wants to teach at a crappy poor school? No one. So no one's gonna go there but the worst teachers. If you had a voucher system where it's like you got a voucher, you could pick the school you went to based on your voucher, you're already paying taxes, then everybody would go to the good schools, no one would go to the bad schools. Right? Yeah, but then there's... So but What do so, you do with all the leftovers? The good schools can so, only take so many. So you, so you get rid of the bad schools, and then you have to figure out, like, if the principal running that school, maybe they could have them start a second school. Right? They're doing something right here. Why, why do you have better teachers? Why do you have a better program? Why is it a yeah. better... It's not just because it's in a rich neighborhood. It's, it's true. That's a that's a fair point. I mean, I feel like a lot of these top down approaches just there. There's pros and cons to all of them, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. There's no perfect solution. There's no perfect solution, and I think a lot of it. I mean, a lot of it deals with the kid. It, it has to do with the kid. There were tons of kids who went to school with me in high school. Not the smartest, you know, knives in the shed, tools in the shed. Uh, but they went to a good school and they got to a good college because they, you know, had the resources to be able to do that, which is kind of unfair, right? You Poss- know, po- possibly, possibly their parents are well off and right, work exactly. the system and put in the work themselves, and the kids just coasted. But <laughs> exactly, and and you think and you think, oh my gosh, well, what about all? What about the other side of the coin where good, hardworking kids, poor neighborhood, the exact same situation that you're saying, you know. How, you can go and I don't know, man. Trying to fix that from the top down and changing everything and, and doing it, I just don't know if it ever works, man. <laughs> like it just it just doesn't ever work. <laughs> we got to try something different, though. That's I like, true. I feel like we're just stuck in this rut where it's like we we keep paying teachers every year more. Yeah. And then it's like next year they complain they need more, so like fine, I'll pay you more. But it comes back to like that college piece. Like, why do you need a college degree to teach? You know, third grade math. Right. Our, our arts and crafts. Like, this isn't like a, I don't know, super technical concept here. We just got to blow it all up, man. Just, <laughs> just blow up just the whole system. Start over. <laughs> Let the revolution begin. <laughs> I don't know, man. Because think of how, I mean, I remember, so I remember the first, one of my first days of college, I was making a joke in class. And the, the professor was like, it was like, that was it. it was international business was the, was the class. And they were saying how like there are different laws between you know between countries, different like, you know all these types of things. Um, and the guy's like, "Why are you? Why are you all here?" And I was just making a joke. I was like, "I just love to learn," you know. And it got a good laugh out of the class, whatever. And the guy and but looking back on that, you kind of need that. Like that's a good skill to have if you actually know how to learn and enjoy it. Yeah. Then. Then, then you make you wind up making choices that are not necessarily about the education. In other words, my choice to go to Baruch, knowing a thousand percent that I wasn't going to learn a damn thing, that wasn't my that wasn't my reason to go. I wasn't expecting to get an uh, an education out of it. I was expecting for job opportunities, a network, 
all those supporting systems because I knew I could do all the learning on the side. I, I could I could figure or, or I already had the knowledge, right? Right. I knew I knew I had the knowledge to work at a bank. I just needed to be in, right? right? So I think part of it also, I mean, I know we were kind of crapping on, you know, sitting at home and learning, you know, how to code and whatever, you know, on your free time. But I think if you either have the skill or you have the passion for one certain thing, that can all you can you can use both to augment each other. You know what I mean? Right. But I think you don't But I think in general it's two pieces. Right? And you're kind of hitting on both of them. One is the education piece. So you need a good academic system to give you access to the classes, the materials, stuff like that. I mean, for example, in financial engineering, a lot of classes don't have textbooks. Right. Yeah, there's no textbook out there to teach it. So someone has to know it and teach it. And then the other half of it is who you are as a person. And that's the piece I struggle to teach like on my podcast, my channel is like, for example, how do you build character? You can't teach that, though. And how do you build perseverance? But the thing is, too, which a lot of listeners don't know here, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Lewis said, you know, you should go out there and be (laughs) (laughs) self-learning. Right? (laughs) Lewis is one of the rarest people, though. You're one of those few people, probably the only other person besides me that I've ever met, that can pick up something technical like a textbook. You can read it, and you you understand it, and you can apply it. Yeah, that's a, that's a definite skill to have. I'm I, I'm a little weird like that. I'm just highly technical that way. Because you know, I mean, looking at the the accreditation part, right? If I saw your resume, it came through my stack, and I pull it up, and it says McGill University from Canada with a business right. a business degree, and yeah. then Bar- Baruch MBA. It's like there's <laughs> no way I'm even going to consider you for for a quant job. Like this is Audi. Awesome. I'm done with this. Toss it. Throw this paper out the window. Right. Right. But again. You're, you're really the only person besides myself I've ever met that can do that. You've got, you've yeah, got, I mean, you've got guys with PhDs, Lewis. I've met a guy with two PhDs and a master's. Oh, I have two. Yeah. I and, have two. And they can't I even scratch the basics. I won't name names. I won't <laughs> name names, but yeah, I mean, but it goes, it goes to your saying. There, you know, you can go to a school, you can go to a state school and get a PhD and it looks like you're really gosh darn smart. Yeah. But you're kind of, but you're not, you know? But that being said, those PhDs that I do know that may or may not have the, the, the skills needed, they're getting paid more than me. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're my bosses or prior bosses or in other parts. You know what I mean? Like, so. Yeah, but I, I think part of it, too, is it's that you, you really have the other piece of it. You have the social accreditation. Right? What do you mean by that? So I tell people, for example, like, you need to go out there and you need to network, Right. So everyone always assumes like you get on LinkedIn and you add all these people and you have like a million connections. That's not networking, right? Networking is like you work with me and we work really well together. Right. So then I go, okay, Lewis, I give him the thumbs up accreditation, right? Exactly. You're five star. Then you go and you work with somebody else. And that person says, Lewis, he's a five star. And you have that social network, that social capital, which is a different episode in this podcast series. But talking about like, how do you build kind of that accreditation or that social capital around you so that when people in the industry look out, they say, you know, I need an all-star to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to go call Lewis. I'm going to call Dimitri. I'm going to call, you know, these other people. And I think it's hard to teach even that piece of it. Like, how do you build that kind of social network around you? And how do you do a good job? You just got to make friends, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's a very good point. But, but so... So yes, absolutely. When when you you have to work well with people for sure. Oh yeah. Um, because because look, just like you said, first of all, not only are you going to know when another person's going to come to your ex coworker, your your friend, whatever, and they're going to say, and you're going they're going to ask about you. Not only that, but two, you know, you work, you help them, they help you. Then they know somebody who needs somebody. They mention you. It it, it does build it. But the the point is. When you're 22 years old, all your friends are just graduating high school or excuse me, college. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. your friends are entry level. Oh, they yeah. have no power. They have no power. That network shows like 10 years later, you know, when you're when you're in your you know late 20s, 30s and beyond. But you got to you got to plant those seeds. Right. You know, and I think part of it, though, is like it's two pieces where you have the academic job performance piece and then you have the soft skill building piece. Yeah. And I think it's hard to explain to people you need both pieces because on the quant side, you see people that run out and get a million degrees and they just care about reading textbooks, which is great. But then, I don't know, you look at yourself, you're into your career and you're like, I don't know, mid pack 
at best in the company. So it's like, that sucks. You didn't really get to where you wanted to go. But yeah. It's like you, you missed the social side. And then you have other people like on the business degrees, they have so much social capital and they're all about being friends with everybody. But yeah, you, but they you can't miss do anything. All this, yeah, you miss, those, <laughs> <laughs> you miss those technical skills so you just can't figure out how to put it together. Yeah, there's definitely a balance. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like, I guess people mostly start on one on either one side of the coin and then they kind of assimilate the second part. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, take you, for example, you know, highly technical, very, you know, very smart. Um, and you built, you, I mean, you went to New York with knowing nothing. nobody. Yeah, no, yeah, it's nothing there. <laughs> and, and built a network for yourself and, you know, wound up getting a gig the other side of the country. You know what I mean? B yeah. Based on that work, right? Um, so I think, you. I, I mean, for me at least, yeah, I, I was definitely more on kind of where you are and said, more technical growing up, certainly. And over time, realizing that the technical skills weren't getting me where I needed to be, having to then pull, you know, almost out of desperation, to be honest with you, is, is what is what forced me to learn that. And I think there's, you know, I think there's something to be said about, you know, necessity in yeah. terms of, of developing these skills, for sure. I, I um, would agree with that. I, I don't think a lot of people struggle enough. So that's one of the things I feel... I feel like for building character or perseverance and kind of those skills that are so hard to teach. Oh, I, yeah. I feel like it always comes out of the fact of like, all right, you, I mean, for me, like I graduated from a school, I paid $70,000 for a master's degree. You're unemployed. You're being kicked out of your apartment because it's school housing. <laughs> being put in that, and then you're married, so you have someone else you're supporting. Neither of you have a job. Like You're describing me at like, <laughs> like 10 years ago. It was, it was, it was, these were tough times. It was yeah, a lot of I, rice and pasta eating. <laughs> Oh, that top ramen. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, I think that's the piece that for me, it's so hard to explain to people. Like I can say like, oh, you need to struggle and life needs to be difficult. Yeah. But everybody looks around and says, oh, my life is tough. It's difficult. But it's like, there's really not a lot of people that look at it. I think from that perspective you have, right? Which is like, you struggle so hard and you're out of desperation. You got to figure something out. I think well, that's a big part of it too. Yeah. I think that's where the breakthrough think... comes. Yeah. Well, true, but luck is a big part of it too. I mean, you think luck seriously? Is? I I really do. I really do think luck is a big part of it. If if I wasn't hired out of Baruch by a bank, I might be go. I might be back working for you know. I won't name the company, but <laughs> not the best company in the world, Co. <laughs> really, you know what I mean? I, I and and that had very little to do with my own. You know, I was, but, but I was known in my MBA as being one of the more technical people. So when that job came up to one of the recruiter people there, they're like, Ooh, who's someone really technical in this class? Oh, Lewis, let me go to him. You don't know you what think I mean? that's, don't you think that's the preparation though? Yes, that's, that's true. That's Cause I always true. argue that with people in the industry. I feel like everyone in finance, everyone I talk to, you ask like, how did you become the CEO? How are you a managing director? They say, well, it was, it was just mainly luck. But then if you start, you start tearing apart the storyline. That's true. It's That's all that. True. I, I agree there's luck involved, right? Like 90% preparation. And then you're so ready for the opportunities that as soon as that comes up, then it's like that luck kicks in and someone happens to ask, you know, I need a Baruch grad who would be the technical person. And then your work kind of lines up with that luck piece. Yeah. That's a fair point. I mean, the Baruch thing is weird too, because who the hell outside of New York City knows what Baruch is? Not a single person. Nobody. Not a single person. The, the fact that they have one of the top rated fi financial engineering master's programs. Oh, is a complete misnomer. I mean, it's because a bunch of Russian dudes came over into New York and started and, you know, built a, built a community there. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> and they're geniuses. They're really smart. My boss is incredibly smart. And he was a, the guy was putting ro rockets into space in Russia. Yeah. Back before, you know. I, I remember some of those guys. Yeah, and, and they, moved, they all moved. They all moved over to New York once things kind of, you know, settled down with the USSR and all that crap, which was way beyond my time. So I'm just talking out of my butt here. <laughs> but a bunch of those guys wound up getting hired at banks, right? Because they had the skill set, and they were all living in New York, working for these big banks, doing doing all the the quad heavy stuff, you know? Yeah. They would teach at Baruch in their spare time. Their kids would go to Baruch because it was a cheap school. Right. It wasn't, you know, wasn't Columbia or NYU charging up the wazoo. Yeah. So for them, it made financial sense and it built a community. So you get a lot, you get a spark. But, but the point was, you know, nobody knows what Baruch is. 
Right. I'd never heard of it. I thought it was pronounced Baruch. Baruch. Baruch or something <laughs> Baruch. weird. And these kids are like, Dimitri, that's not how you pronounce it. It's Baruch. And I'm like, and like you're from a third world. Like, you're from a different country. How, like, how, how are you telling know? me how to pronounce <laughs> it? Like... <laughs> But but that's a program that no like if I'm if I want to work at a bank in San Francisco yeah it's not I have no happen. shot I have no shot it's only in New York where the people who work at these banks in New York know of the school right so there's a regional component to that too I, I mean it was for me it was a inexpensive you know option to get an advanced degree to get looked at by these guys um, but if I was I couldn't do the same thing in the middle of I don't know, Michigan or something like yeah. that. I wasn't going to go to a, a, a you know, a, a city or a state school in Michigan and then expect to travel to New York and have the same guys. You know what I mean? So there's yeah. a regional component as well if you're going to go that route. Otherwise, you pay 200 grand and you go to you go to, you try and get to Columbia or you try and get to you know a well globally well known school. Yeah, you know? for us that was the that was the worst part about Michigan. So it's like the best state school in the country, one of the best schools in the world. But we're, yeah. si- we're situated here. It's like you got Chicago on Who one side there? and New York on the other. It's like we're so far from both. No one wants to come find us. It's like, yeah, it's too much effort. And there's not a lot of industry there, too. It's not like there are people plucking, you know, every day, pl- need- needing more and more people. And it's a big school, too. There's a ton of competition. Oh, yeah. You know? So these are these are all options. I mean, it's, di- it's a difficult choice, you know, particularly if, if like, I'm, I'm guessing what's your average viewer? Like, they're they're approaching... So it started out probably about 20, probably from about 20 to 26. Okay. So both graduate school, undergrad, maybe a little bit afterwards. And the weird part now is I have people messaging me like, Dimitri, I'm 16 years old in high school <laughs> looking for some career. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm confused. Oh, like, buddy. When I was 16, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, and I'm starting to get older people now too. So I'll get people that reach out and say, you know, I'm a, I'm a director at XYZ Bank. Really? I, I like your videos. I've recommended them to my employees to watch. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. So it's hard to teach some of those skills. And if someone's already got a channel for it, why why reinvent the wheel? Yeah. God, 16 years old, coming already desperate for career advice. Isn't that or, crazy? That's freaking nuts. It's, so let's answer this question. That, this was something I wanted to chat about was, what do you think about the U.S.'s education system <sighs> versus others? Because a lot of these, these students that are younger are coming from other countries. International. And they have the track where it's like you go through sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, something, and then all of a sudden you specialize. Yeah. And then the United States, right, you're so well rounded all the way through. Yeah. So I'll let you weigh in first and I'll tell you. I've thought about it for like five, ten years now, just thinking about these systems. Which is, yeah, the pros and cons of each, right? Yeah. I, again, maybe this is my bias. Maybe, I, so uh, full disclosure, I went to a Jesuit high school in New York City. Which is uh, which is a very much a well-rounded. Uh, I'm still waiting for my payout from the Catholic Church. You know, I've got, <laughs> I've got a my, I've got a, a father-in-law deceased who uh, he's like I was never you know diddled by the priest. Why not me? It's given me a, it's given me it's given me a complex. I'm gonna sue. But um, so but it was a great school and a great education. But it was a well it was that traditional well-rounded education, right? Right. Um, liberal, liberal arts education. Um, which, so that's my bias and I'm partial to that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think it gives you options, right? Mm-hmm. You, what happens if you specialize when, as you're saying, 16, 17 years old and shit, 10 years down the line, I freaking hate financial engineering. I hate quantitative finance. This is the most boring crap in the world. Get me out of here. I want to work under a car, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so. You, you're you're really limiting your options that way, I, I think, um, or or potentially limiting your options, we'll say. Um, so it gives you more. I think it literally gives you more options. It exposes you to more things, so you can pull information from different areas, right? Right. Um, it teaches you different ways to learn. The way you learn math, engineering, mm-hmm. physics, things like this is different than chemistry, where it's a lot of experimentation. It's different from English, which is a lot of, uh, you know, creative thinking and, and visualization in your head and all this stuff. Yeah. So I think you, I think not only is it different topics that you're learning, but it's different methods of learning, which I think is important. Um, so I think there are benefits to a well-rounded education. And, you know, 
geez, how, how long are you doing that for? Maybe at the most through undergrad, 20 years of your life. Yeah. You say the average age, you, know, you work until you're 50, 60, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're lucky, you get another 30, 40 years to specialize in something, right? I'm, I'm sure if, if you're 25 years old and you want to specialize in being an auto mechanic, you can be a damn good auto mechanic in 10 years. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't think it's limiting you so much. Um, so that, that's my take on it. Okay. So I, I started off on the other side of it. I remember graduating being like, work, like competing with these top people in financial engineering programs. So it's like Chinese students who are ranked like top 10 in their province for math competitions, global math. I don't know if they're called math champions or whatever. And I yep. remember thinking like, it makes so much more sense if we specialized, right? You're so much better prepared. And one of my big criticisms of quantitative finance in this whole is that 99.9% of everyone in the industry has no clue what they're doing. They're vastly, <laughs> they're vastly underprepared. That is true. <laughs> and so I started thinking like, it makes more sense to have very specific skills. And then as I worked through the industry for the years and I got more and more experience, I started looking around and realizing like basic common sense things, or at least things that I thought were common sense. My colleagues had no idea from other countries. Yes. And yes. like even like medicine, food, health, things like these are very foreign and they can't make well-educated decisions. And it's really shocking because you think like as an American, everybody knows this, everybody knows that. Like it's not hard to figure out. But I feel like you're missing, like, as a life perspective, you miss so much information that you don't live as good of a life without knowing a little bit of everything and being more well-rounded. Sure. And then I start thinking back now as you're talking, and I'm thinking, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a professional motocross rider, like an athlete. And then that didn't pan out. And then I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I'm thinking, like, if I was so specialized at a young age, I probably would have had a career I hated. It was just been, yeah. just been miserable. And I think that's what, going back to that solution here is, I think there needs to be more professionals in high schools in the US to give, oh, you, I, yeah, to give you ideas of like, these are all the cool careers out there, but hey, you still got right high school to finish. You still got two years of generals in college. And yeah. then you can kind of specialize and pick what you want to do with it. That's, I mean, well, I'm trying to think, I mean, I'm trying to imagine what would happen if, any professional, well, not any, but let's say a, someone who's in quantitative finance came to my high school and was like, hey, guys, <laughs> you want to learn about math? <laughs> um, <laughs> I would have, zo I mean, I was zoning out on stuff that I liked, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think a large part of it, but I remember my parents had friends who were in the financial industry who were engineers or mathematicians who were sm smart technical people um and so that kind of i don't know it just gave me like a like almost a communal sense of oh okay that makes sense. people i know do this right you know like like you know, like my crew we do this you know so it, it that type of exposure in your personal life it was very important to me right because i'll tell you if a if a doctor if an, a, a lawyer a mechanic a professional, mo I mean, maybe a professional motocross rider would be awesome. But you know, if these guys came into high school and was like, "Hey guys, I'm gonna speak to the class today," I would have just been like, "Screw this," you know, <laughs> like, like I'm 15 years old, I'm 16 years old, I, you know, dreaming about girls and whatever. Like, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. But I, but I, but I see what you're saying. I think there needs to be more exposure. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but I think yeah. there has to be exposure. I, I think you have to get a sense of of what's out there as a kid. You yeah. know, because I remember taking math classes and thinking like matrices, for example, right? Why are we doing this? In school, you always learned like, okay, you take this matrices and this is how you multiply the row columns and the rows and this is how you get a new one. But there's never any application. I was like, why Like, why are we doing this? It like, <laughs> exactly. makes no sense. And even in college, I remember taking intro stats for business students. Yeah. And I hated the class. And I told this buddy of mine, I was like, this is the dumbest thing. Do people like expect me to go out in the world and be like, oh, the probability of doing this is, you know, I'm teen percent. We'll build a model right. and it'll predict something. This is stupid. Right. But I feel like but if you I had, had a basic concept. Yeah. But I feel like if I had someone come in there and stood in front of me, even like in college, yeah. right? Even that first year or two and said, Dimitri, this is what you can do with stats in finance. I would have been like mind blown. Like, wow, this is like shocking. I've never seen this because they don't teach that to you in an actual That's business true. story. That's true. That's yeah, true. Yeah, that's a good point. 
I remember the first time I learned eigenvalues, I was like, there is no way. Makes no sense. <laughs> there's no way I am ever, I don't even care if I'm the most technical person in the world. There's no way I'm ever using this. And I haven't to this freaking day. I still have never had to. But, <laughs> but, I, but I see your point. I'm just, yeah. being, I'm just being, I'm being purposely, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, abrasive here. But, um, but, but, it's, but it's a fair point. That's, that's a fair point. But I, also you have to get the basics of things, right? Like, like probably like, take, take random, you know, just, just general probability of, of events happening. Right. Thinking about things like that, you know, to, to your point earlier where there's a, a bit of a lack of common sense in certain industries, particularly highly specialized industries, mm -hmm. you know, having basic concepts from four or five different areas or, or you know, different, um, uh, not practices. Disciplines. Uh, pursuit. Yeah, exactly. When, it, when nobody knows what the hell they're really doing and everyone's kind of making it up along the way, having those basic structures helps you make it up along the way. You know, it, it, it helps you think clearly and be able to pull, you know, so you're not just staring at, oh, man, I don't know what the heck an eigenvalue is. I'm screwed. Well, yeah. let me just make it up by pulling a bunch <laughs> of stuff over here, which is kind of what you're going to do anyway when you're on the job. Let's be real. Oh, I got you. <laughs> I definitely think so. I think one of the biggest advantages is having different educational backgrounds on top of your job. It helps you gonna look at problems from different angles. Yeah. So to wrap this up with two final questions. All right. It's going to be this almost the same question. What would your advice be to just an average general person for education? And what would your advice be to someone who wants to work in quantitative finance for education? All right. Let me take let me take the latter one first. Okay. Because I think it's a little I think it's a little easier to, to, to answer. To work in quant finance, particularly to succeed in it, you have to have the you got to have the basic technical skills. You just there's no getting around it. The second you get put in front of somebody who does and they talk to you, they're going to know immediately if you're just talking out of your butt or not. Yeah. So however you do it and, and whether it's going to a school and paying an exorbitant amount of money or going to another school and paying less money. Whatever avenue it takes you to, to, to learn those skill sets, you have to, you have to do that, right? And it's, it's, it's up to that person's decision the best way to do it. For me, I could never learn it online. There's just no way. Yeah. I, I, and, and I, you know, I do like to learn new things. I think it's, you know, I think as I get older, it's probably a little more difficult. When you're young, it's easy. You have the energy and you have the curiosity. So, so serious, but, but seriously, I was thinking about this earlier in preparation for this podcast. I was like, I was like, man, I remember when I was like 17, 18 years old and I would just eat, like, just eat food up, just eat stuff up, all this, you know, food for thought and everything. It was so much easier to put, you know, to, to learn and to have the energy to do it when you're young. Right. Um, so I would say to maximize that energy as much as possible. You know, uh -huh. don't, don't be a stick in the mud and do, and you know, whatever, whatever means it takes you to learn those technical skills, you have to do that in terms of actually getting into the field is almost a, a completely different task. Um, yeah, yeah I because agree. you, th this for, for, and again, for me, it took me four years of having crap jobs and going back to an MBA at a place that I knew at least I was in, I, I had a chance of getting looked at, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that, that was, that was, and you know, your life situation, I didn't have a lot of money. So I, you know, for me taking 200 grand out to go to Columbia was, was a scarier proposition than 20 grand to go to Baruch. Right. Right. Um, so that, you know, is a, is a factor as well. But in terms of actually landing a job, you have to put yourself in a position where people are going to look at you. You have to kind of give yourself the most chance for good luck to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be in the right area, you know, Again, I'm crapping on Alabama, but don't go to the middle of Alabama if you're looking to get hired by a global bank. It's just it's just not going to happen. You right. know, um, networking is is networking is important. But when you're at least if you're an undergrad student and you're graduating, let's be real. I mean, I didn't have a, a, a great network when I was 22 years old. Yeah, I didn't either. I know what I that mean, meant. That's it's like and I remember everyone would say develop your network lewis yeah. well my network are the people that i drink beer with you know on like <laughs> yeah on the weekends <laughs> <after> here. class <laughs> or on the weekends like i'm that network is developed you know 
Um, but it, so I think you have to you have to put yourself in the situation where good things can happen to you, whether it's being in the right physical location, being around the right people, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and again, a lot of it's luck. Sometimes banks are just not hiring. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, in 2009, nobody was hiring. I, I was screwed. I could have been the smartest kid in the world with the, with a great network. Just not a lot there. Yeah. Four years later, when I'm in the right location, I had the right degree, um, and banks were now hiring because business was picking up. Now is when you have a chance. So, and when you do get your chance, you have to make the most. Excuse me, you have to make the most of it. Right. Because if you remember some of the people that we worked with back in the day, <laughs> remember the. Uh, uh, with the dancer, I forget her. I don't want to. Yeah, I know, I know you're talking about. Yeah. So some people, you have to make the most of your opportunity once you get it, right? Right. Um, so that's another. That's another thing too. And you know, small opportunities lead to bigger opportunities, right? So I think it's difficult to to say that there's one one. Th there's no one thing that you can do. It's like, oh, if I just do step A, B, C, I'm gonna get a job as uh, you know as a quant somewhere. Right. You got you got to you got to put yourself in the right situation where it can happen to you. Um, I think that would be the the, the advice there. Is, I just, are you are you satisfied with that answer? Yo, dude, How that's to... great. That's perfect. I think the hard part for me is explaining to people like you need to do steps A, B, C, and D to get the bare minimum, but that doesn't guarantee the job. There's all this extra work you got to do, yeah. and so people for me always come to me and say, Dimitri, I don't want to get a master's degree. What's the shortcut?" And I'm looking at them like the master's is just like the scratch of the bare minimum. And like you're alluding to, right, you could get that master's top name school and everything. Yep. It could be a bad market. You might not have a good social network. Things might not work out for you. And yep. you're still unemployed with a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt and no, no opportunity. Right. So I think it's well, a perfect so answer. I'll give, I'll give you another example. We have a, an in, we, so we have a rotating intern, I guess, group at the bank that goes through all the different groups mm -hmm. and you know he or she whoever this person happens to be rotates there for i think for six months okay and they do it a little bit and then once they're done uh, maybe somebody picks them up or not so it could be something like that i mean if you're if you're just a bank intern and you do six months and this group that you don't even care about but you just do the work and then next time you rotate you rotate to a desk or you rotate to a risk management position or with the risk you know a risk group and you really make the most of that opportunity, yeah, they'll look at you. You know what I mean? Because they've yeah. been working with you for six months. You're useful to them. I mean, you know, we, we had one. She was great. I wish we had kept her on because she did all the grunt work. I didn't have to do any <laughs> of that bullshit. Um, she did it quickly. You know, like she was really good at her job. And if she had wanted, if, if we had the opening and if she had wanted it, I, she would have had my vote in an instant. Like, yeah. Boom. You know, hire her, pay her, you know, whatever she, you know, whatever that is. And uh, it would have been great. So, yeah. So what about what general, general advice? What would you just say for an average person, not necessarily going into quantitative finance? Maybe they want to get a college degree. Maybe they don't want to get a college degree. I, I, I you know, it's a, that's a tough question. I've, I've, and I, so I'll say this. Um, you know, we were talking about a general liberal arts kind of degree, the values to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think having options is good. And if you're graduating high school, you know, also, you can't really screw up that much. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have a lot of money, usually, you yeah. know. You don't really have any responsibility. You're not beholden to anyone. Uh, I've known people who've taken a year off have gone back to college after, you know, doing that thing for a bit, have been okay. It, you're not really going to screw yourself. It, that's, what, that's what killed me when you're like, I've got 16-year-olds reaching out to me desperate for quant finance advice and how to get into the industry. Yeah. Like you're 16 years old. What Even if you do all the right things, you might not be able to. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that there is – a one one thing to do, you know, to the app for the average person. But I will say a couple of things. One is when you're young, you have the opportunity to learn. You have way much more. You have so much energy. I mean, your body's just flooded with friggin' hormones. So you've got tons of energy. 
you got tons of brain space because you haven't been beaten down by life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with that one. <laughs> but but you know what I mean? Like you you everything's new to you and you're learning everything. So you want to maximize that. You want to put yourself in. You want to get as much experiences as you can um, to see what you like and to see what you're good at. Right. So uh, I, I would I would say to maximize your I don't want to say education, but I'll say educational experiences. And whether that's going to be taking a year off, maybe you're one of those people who wants to take a year off. Not a bit, not the worst thing in the world. You, again, you can't do so, so much damage that it's, you know, irreparable. Yeah. You want to go to a trade school because you want to be a mechanic or, you know, the next motocross Travis Pastrano guy, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Travis Pastrami, I don't know what his name is. Um, <laughs> you got it. Like Travis Pastrana. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the X Games too, man. Um, if you want to do that, I think, I think the, the most important thing when you're young, particularly if you don't know what you want to do, is to get as much experience as you can with different things and learn as much as possible about, you don't have to, you don't have to dive into the weeds, but learn what, you know, learn about things. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't. I don't. I wouldn't say pigeonhole yourself, but don't just do one thing where you you're cutting yourself off to opportunities, or yeah. you're cutting yourself off to to, to learning experiences. Um, again, not. I, I feel like. I feel like. I have, well, first of all, I feel like I'm not giving great answers, and second of all, I feel like there aren't really great answers. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like these are tough questions. No, no, it's perfect. The best advice I ever got was I sat down with a guy that was a, worked in sales and trading. And he worked on the sales side and he t I laid out my plan and told him, I want to do X, Y, and Z and I want to be a trader and I want to do all this stuff. And he goes, Danny Trader, I'm going to give you some advice. Let's, let's sit down and like write this out on a notebook for me. So a guy at a bank yeah. I happened to be in contact with, and he told me life is never a linear. So, yeah. he's, so he said, you're going to have all kinds of opportunities. Don't turn down good opportunities just because it doesn't fit your, like your dream plan or your perfect plan. Yes. And I took that advice to heart. And now looking back, I don't work in trading. But I work in right. client finance. I couldn't be happier. I didn't even know these opportunities existed. So trying to get to that piece and kind of navigating is perfect. And I think that's kind of the advice you're giving is, all right, look at those opportunities, talk to these people, learn as much as you can from every different venue. And then you can kind of make better decisions as you kind of muddle your way through your life with the rest of us here. Yeah, and push. And I think, I think the other thing is to push. Because when, when you're young, you know, I remember being 16, 17 years old and, and being like, ooh, I like this. But I'm just going to experience it. I'm not going to really explore it. No, go into it and like and see how far you can push. Because I think that's an important thing too is to actually when you're especially when you're that young, be aggressive about it. Really explore what's you know what that opportunity entails or what that whether it's quant finance or whether it's whatever. I mean, I used to love playing video games. My first when I was you were saying how you wanted to be a, uh, a motocross racer. Yeah, I was like I'm going to design computer hardware. I'm going to be a computer engineer. I'm going to go work in a, in a, in a fabricating lab in the middle of China somewhere in a clean room, <laughs> you know, with the, with the freaking, you the know, suit on, the and and the whole, yeah. <laughs> I would have been fine with COVID and, um, and that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. And then I took my first electronics class and I was like, screw this. <laughs> These things are so small. I can barely see them and I don't have the dexterity to do any of this. It's a mess. So explore the opportunities, push as hard as you can. Um, and you know, and like you said, don't be beholden to one path. Perfect. All right. Thank you for coming on, Lewis. Right on. 